So uh, today I'm going to cover, at least I'm going to try to cover three topics. And I'll finally get to the IP header. I've been meaning to talk to you about this for a while now. And so we'll go into the IP header and, and I'll talk about uh, uh, address allocation. How do we get the addresses to the uh, hosts and routers in the first place? And then uh, once we have an idea how to get addresses, we'll talk about routing in a local area network, which we also call a LAN. So those are the three uh, things. IP is the protocol that holds the internet together. Okay? Everybody uh, or every device, every router, every host has to agree on one thing, which is IP. And the reason they have to do that is because the addresses that are in the IP header uh, decide where it's going to go to. So if people don't agree on it, then you can't get from here to there. It means everybody has to agree that this is the IP address. Now, uh, it's not exactly true. Strictly speaking, you can take the IP address, sort of translate it to something else internally, and then get back to an IP address inside some private network. And in fact, that's done inside the backbone. But, uh, uh, but everybody along the path has to agree that if you translate it from IP to something else, you've got to get back to where you started from. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Okay. So uh, it's, uh, uh, the IP header is the set of information that's carried on the front of every IP packet. So you call that the IP metadata. So you have the data which you're actually sending, and then this is like the envelope for a letter which carries the address and the stamp, source address, things like that. So in the same way, the IP has a header. And when you try to uh, understand any new protocol, it's often uh, easy, uh, easiest to understand the protocol by looking at the header. So you look at the header, and you look at all the fields in it, and that tells you what the protocol does. It's like an x-ray into, uh, into a protocol. So you can, if you can get the protocol headers and look at them, you pretty much know what's possible. So for example, if the IP header didn't have a, you know, some field is missing, then you know you can't do it because if it's not in the IP header, it's not going to get done. Right? So we have some good way of doing it. So it's worthwhile looking at all the fields. Now typically, when we describe the IP header, we are going to put you know, so many bits for each field and so on in the layout. It actually doesn't really matter. What's really the only thing that matters is what the fields are. So I'm just going to write them down. We will start with the first one. So this is a field. The version field tells you what version of IP is being used. And uh, at this point, there are only two versions, 4 and 6. So <clears throat> sort of a brief sort of digression into why we need version numbers. Uh, the reason for version numbers is because things change, right? So we want to design a protocol that's going to last you know, 10 years, 20 years, or IP has been around for about uh, 40 years now. Right? It'll be 40 years next year, so it's 39 years old. When you design such a protocol, you want to make sure that it's going to last for a long time, right? So when you're, when you're, if you're working somewhere, you design a protocol at the application layer, for example, your tic-tac-toe protocol, okay? You might come up with a protocol, and then you might decide that, you know, it's going to last 100 years. How do you know what people are going to do 100 years from now, right? So what you do is you don't know. So you put a version number on it. And what you do is you put the version number, let's say, 4 or 3 or 2, whatever. And then if you change the protocol, you change the version number, the receiver then says, OK, if this version is the old one, then I can go do the old processing. If it's a new one, I'll do the new processing. And this allows you to be backwards compatible, right? So whenever you have a protocol, it's good to be backwards compatible because there will always be people who don't upgrade, right? The people who continue to have the old version and then uh, to, to, to support them, it's always good to have version numbers. So it takes a few extra bits. So every single packet on the internet carries these four extra bits, which is sort of a lot of wasted capacity, one might say. On the other hand, it allows evolution. Okay. So IPv4 came out so said in 1973. I don't even remember whether there was 1, 2, and 3. I think they went from straight to 4. <laughs> Probably not. Maybe they had some 1, 2, and 3, but I have no idea what they were. I've uh, never seen them being described anywhere. Um, and then 5 was a version that didn't quite make it, so they went to 6. And 6 has been the protocol of the future for the last uh, 20 years. It's always been the protocol of the future. Okay? So <laughs> there's a joke about... Uh, Alice in Wonderland, you know, and Alice, she goes to the Mad Hatter's tea party, and the Mad Hatter is pouring her tea, and he said, you should come yesterday, we had jam yesterday. And she said, really, jam yesterday? She, he said, yeah, and jam tomorrow. And jam yesterday, jam tomorrow, but no jam today. She said, what if you come tomorrow? She said, well, tomorrow there'll be jam yesterday and jam tomorrow, but no jam today. So it's IPv6 is like that, you know. IPv6, tomorrow, but not today. So every day, it's the next day. Uh, 
So uh, it was supposed to have been rolled out, and every year there's a big initiative we're going to roll it out. Right now it constitutes about 0.01% of all traffic on the internet, and chances are it'll go up to maybe 1% in the next, who knows, 10 years, something like that. So, and as we go into routing a little bit later, you'll see why IPv6 is so difficult to get into it, get, get, uh, to change to, because everything has got to change. Every single uh, router has got to change. Every single uh, host has got to change. All of DNS has got to change. And all the embedded applications, which have hard-coded IP addresses in them, which are IPv4 addresses, have also got to change. So for the indefinite future, we're going to have v4 and v6. And so for now, we're just going to focus on v4, you know, v6. Again, you know, it's, it's for the future. So that's, uh, and, and the main difference between v4 and v6 is just that v6 has longer addresses. v4 has 32-bit addresses. And v6 is 128-bit addresses, so it's four times longer, and uh, that's the main difference. The other differences are really minor, really long, more addresses. Okay, so that's the first field. The second one is the header length. Okay, and this is in uh, in words, which is four byte, which is four bytes. So why do we need the header length? Okay, why would anybody need a header length field? That's right. Okay, so the reason is correct. The reason is because uh, the header length can vary, right? And the reason it can vary is because another field is called the options field. And the options are optional, right? That's the meaning. So the header length, typically the header is 20 bytes, or which is uh, five words. And like almost all IP packets are five words. Uh, almost all IP packets have a header that's five words in length. However, uh, it is possible to add options uh, to, you know, to, the, to the IP header. And if you have those options, then the length field increases. So what kind of options could you have? One option in IP is to say, it's called the record route option. It says, OK, as I go through, each router is supposed to add to the header what uh, uh, what its IP address is, right? So you can you can kind of just like you do a trace route, you can as you have a path, each router will add the uh, the router address over here, and then it'll actually compute the. So if you do ping, I think this is ping minus capital R. That's a record route option. That sets a record route option on the IP header. What will happen is you'll actually get back the path from the IP header. However, <laughs> however. Uh, this is not implemented everywhere, and some uh, uh, routers, in order to increase the speed of the router, whenever they see the uh, header length is not 20, they'll just silently drop the packet. They'll just say, yeah, it's too, too complicated. I don't want to do it. They'll just drop it. Okay. And <laughs> IP is best effort, right? It's not guaranteed. So uh, you know, it's be they didn't, they, their best effort was to not make any effort. And they'll say, and, and, you know, either they ignore it or they drop it, one of the two. And so there are some other options. The most commonly used one, as I said, is the record route option. But um, again, the designers back in 1973 uh, figured out that uh, we don't know what the future is going to hold. You know, we know that we hope that the internet is going to be successful. Remember, the internet was a lab experiment that went awfully right. Okay, it was what they call a success disaster because it wasn't completely figured out, and suddenly everybody was using it, and it, ra it was became completely out of control. It's like you're growing a you're growing a bacterial culture in your lab, you know, and suddenly it explodes and takes over the whole world, and it wasn't quite properly engineered. Okay? And as you'll see later, when you talk about security, the internet is a, a lab experiment gone wrong, okay? and it's an awful, awful disaster. Okay? Um, but at any rate, uh, that will come later in the story. They were smart enough to put in the option field because they thought maybe someday somebody may want some options, so let's allow that. So they put in the header length field and the option field, and it was basically an experiment, right? So we don't know what's going to happen. Even we don't know what we want you know, five years from now. So let's put it in, and we might want to use it later. So that's the option field. And that's where you have the header length. And uh, if you didn't have options, you didn't need, we wouldn't need a header length. The fourth field is a very sad, very sad field. It's called the type of service field. And behind this innocuous-looking term is a very, very important and uh, Tragic, tragic story of many people's lives, including mine. Okay, so what's going on here? How can there be a story behind the field? The type of service is trying to tell the network what 
service this packet wants, right? So let's think about what that means for a moment. So let's say I have a voice call, a Skype call that's going across the internet, and I have somebody else transferring you know, a BitTorrent file, you know, a very large file, okay? So, so just think about this. Here's a router, and the router gets one packet that's a voice packet, and then there's another packet that's a, a BitTorrent packet, a very large packet. The voice packets are typically, typically quite small, about 40 bytes, 50 bytes, really small. And here's this very large packet, and it's a lot of very large packets, actually, which are all the BitTorrent packets. It's a couple of gigabytes, right, per file. So you've got all these big packets sitting here, voice is sitting over here. Now, imagine that you go to a place where there's a queue. So I used to say go to the bank, but of course you guys go to ATMs. So I don't know, the Tim Hortons, right? So you go to Tim Hortons, there's some guy ahead of you who wants to buy you know, 20 double-doubles and you know, big box of donuts. You want to select every one of them. And there's not one of them, there's 15 of those guys. And you just want one small regular coffee and you zip out of there. Right? So they're all standing in line ahead of you. OK, that's what it looks like to the small voice packet. Voice packet is sitting there, and these guys selecting all their, using up all the resources of the server are ahead of them. What the type of service field said was, you know what, why don't we let this guy zip ahead, the voice packet zip ahead, cut, out, cut ahead of everybody else in the queue, and this way they won't suffer long delays. And if they don't suffer long delays, you know what, the, 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 the big packets won't even notice because anyway they're getting a bit torrent, right? It's going to take four, five, eight hours to get the movie they're illegally downloading in the first place. So you may as well let the voice go through. Even in your ho own home gateway, you might argue that it makes sense to have, you know, if you're doing a BitTorrent and a Skype at the same time, that your Skype package should go ahead of your BitTorrent package. It kind of makes sense. That thinking of delay sensitive and delay insensitive tra traffic went into the putting in the type of service field in the header. So, okay, we'll have the type of service be delay insensitive. We don't really care. You know, as long as we get through someday, it's fine. It doesn't matter. No. The other one says delay sensitive. I really care about delay. Now push me through to the head of the line. Exactly the same situation holds in the road traffic where we have ambulances and regular traffic, right? Ambulances zip through to the front, right? It's a red light, doesn't matter. They turn on the side and off they go. We want to have sort of the ambulance type of service and we want the uh, you know, semi 18, 18 wheeler truck uh, type of service. So just go through, delay is not so important. To get this to work, however, uh, requires everybody in the internet to col collaborate. Everybody has to agree to it. So they can agree on IP addresses, that's fine, but they also have to agree that if the ambulance bid is set, everybody is going to give it priority. But, and here's where the big problem with the internet is today and will remain forever, as far as I can make out, but why should everybody not set the ambulance bid on all their packets, right? It's like saying, I can go first class if I just set my ambulance bit. I can go first class. Why should everybody not set their bits to be first class? If first class doesn't cost anymore, everybody would fly first class, right? So if ambulance bit doesn't cost you anymore, everybody would turn the ambulance bit on. So the, you know, we'd say, yeah, I'm an ambulance too. You know, let me through. So you immediately see that to have any kind of type of service, you've got to have teeth. You've got to say, okay, no, you must enforce the rule that, yes, you can or cannot turn this bit on. If you have that bit on, you better be an ambulance. Otherwise, you're going to send you to jail. So if you get a flashing red light and you put it in your car and you go through a red light, you can go to jail, right? But we don't have a police on the Internet. If your packets are going to, you know, let's pick a random place, you know, Sierra Leone, you know, the Sierra Leone ISP is not... <laughs> I'm assuming nobody here is from Sierra Leone. I'm sorry if I offend anybody. But uh, that particular uh, part of the internet has no way to enforce that you do not set this bit. And the other way around, if they set bits, if all packets emanating from Sierra Leone happen to have the bit set, there's nothing you can do about it. They're their own independent country. And if they insist on putting all the bits to one, either you ignore all the bits or you, you, know, you, you kind of just you don't, don't know, you don't know, right? And the internet is designed in a way where the endpoints are sort of anonymous. We don't really know who's doing what, where, when, where the bits are coming from. And so the type of service bit, on the other hand, is something where there's uniform behavior. Everybody's got to agree to it. Everybody's got to, uh, got to believe in it. And importantly, you have to actually charge for it. Otherwise, there's no repercussion to it. And to charge for it means that if I send a packet to baidu.com from here, 
some of that transit is going through China, right? Because it's in China. We know that. It's in Beijing. So from the moment it enters China to the time it gets to Baidu, certainly it's with some Chinese ISP. And if they're going to give higher priority to my packets, they want me to pay for it. So what am I going to charge them for? So I do a, I do a Baidu search from here. I'm going to pay them one ten millionth of a penny for that search. And I'm going to do that for every search. I don't even know. I mean, if I go on a website and there are 20 different ads, who am I going to pay and for what? And how much? And how is it all going to be add, uh, added up? So the accounting infrastructure to account for it is basically impossibly complicated. And so it never got done. And because it never got done, we don't have it. And so this type of service field, which went into the uh, design of the internet at that time, is basically ignored. It's just four, uh, three bits sitting there. Nobody's using them. And people use them for other purposes because it's unused. So where is the sad story here? The sad story here, and I'll tell you that in just one minute, starting now, is that around 1989, people in the phone network, in the phone industry, said, you know, we know how to do type of service. We know how to do that on the phone. Why don't we make the internet look like the phone service and provide good quality of service? And they said, well, IP is terrible. You know, it's not very good. We're going to do it a different way. We're going to do it using a technique called ATM, you know, uh, asynchronous transfer mode. And without going into too many details, it's virtual circuits. So you have this path that's pinned down, like we talked about last time. It's completely pinned down. So we know what path is going to be. Moreover, every router along the path has a chance to say, I'm going to charge you so much for this quality of service. And so you can actually get end-to-end -end type of service on ATM. I got involved in ATM back in 1989, 1990, 89. And I worked in it for about seven or eight years. But by 1997, it became clear that ATM was not going to work. ATM was not going to be able to compete with IP because of various political and technical reasons. And so all the work in ATM, basically, I had to you know, get rid of. Uh, uh, so it's eight years of work. I just said, well, another terrible mistake, ATM. <laughs> and that's the end of that. And it wasn't just me. It's uh, hundreds of researchers, thousands of researchers, lots and lots of uh, corporate dollars, research dollars, equipment, all sorts of stuff. Probably a few hundred billion dollars worth of uh, research and equipment and technology was you know, basically thrown away uh, because <coughs> ATM lost to IP. And uh, that's the tragedy behind the type of service field. So this doesn't actually work, and the competitor to this didn't actually win. So today, we still don't have quality of service on the internet. Today, we're kind of still stuck with the fact that your local router is going to put the Skype packets behind the, the uh, BitTorrent packets, for example, you can't really prioritize it in any way, and we really don't have any kind of type of service. If, you, if it doesn't work, well, that's, that's the internet. Sorry, we can't do anything better, right? So, so that's the problem we have. And there are some other issues as well. At this point in the internet today, the packets that are, that are going to the internet, they are, they are every, everybody is equally good or bad. Yeah, so different, differentiated services field is another half-hearted attempt to give you better quality of the differential services, the two, it's called in-serve and diff-serve. So diff-serve or differential services basically says that I'm going to give this packet better service than somebody else, but I won't tell you how good it is. It's just better than somebody else, right? It's like saying, you're going first class. First class is terrible, but it's better than second class. Okay. So <laughs> the snacks are better in first class than second class. So that's differentiated service, but the snacks are terrible in both classes, so it doesn't really matter. So that's uh, diff-serve. So that even, even that doesn't quite work. Okay? I mean, even that doesn't really, hasn't really made it. So it's a series of uh, failures. And in fact, one of the biggest failures <laughs> in, in networking research has been how many papers have been written on this? How many books have been written? I wrote a book about it in 1997. And that's also, unfortunately, uh, obsolete. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how I wrote a new one. OK, we'll take a break. And then I'll come back to the rest of the fields. Okay. Next field is the length field. And now this is the length of the, of the uh, header plus data. And this is in bytes. And this is a 16-bit field. This is one thing that's important. So the largest number of bytes you can send is 65, 5, 36. This is a number that every computer scientist has engraved, you know, tattooed on their brain, 65536, 2 to the power 16. 
So uh, that's the largest number of bytes. It's the largest IP packet is 65536. OK. So that's because, of course, the packets are variable length. All right, so now we come to three fields. OK, I'm going to do, yeah, let me talk about a fun field, which is the TTL field, which is, stands for time to live. And the time to live field is like a countdown timer. It's like a, uh, it's like, <laughs> it's like a bomb that goes off, and the time to live goes to zero. Pff, like it is destroyed. Okay, so uh, it's a field that's set to some number between zero and two fifty five at the source by the source, and then it's decremented by every router. And then if field is 0, then you're going to drop it. That's what I mean by it's like a bomb going off. So first question is, OK, I'm, uh, first question is why do it? You know, why should you set, uh, why should there be a time to live field in the header? So why would, why would you need it? The early internet had routing tables that were not particularly good, right? They would have what's called uh, infinite loops. So you send it out. You know, it's like going down. <laughs> if you go down Iron Needles, that you know that that part, that road over there, uh, the boulevard, there's traffic the roundabouts. So imagine you go down this road, you get to the traffic roundabout, and then you go round and round and round and round and round forever, right? Until you, you run out of gas, basically. Uh, that would happen routinely on the internet. It was very buggy in the early days. Extremely, extremely buggy. So. So they said, okay, right, you know, we don't want to have packets build up forever and you know, take up bandwidth just going round and round doing no work. We'll put this TTL field. It was basically a hack, okay, because the routing tables weren't very good, okay? Well, routing pro algorithms weren't very good. And so that's what happened. It's a time to live field. Uh, today we still do it because we still have routing problems. Even today there are routing loops, there are, you know, forwarding loops and so on. And so a time to live is a good engineering solution. It says, look, yeah, we, our routing tables are supposed to be consistent. We are supposed to have everything kind of work, but if it doesn't, we're still okay. And that's what engineers do, right? You have the belt and suspenders. Your pants never fall down. You have belt and suspenders. So you have routing tables that are consistent, hopefully, and you have time to live field, and this is what we have today, right? And from a control theoretic perspective, which I won't go into uh, later, the, the, uh, I won't talk about that, but just for those of you who are familiar with control theory, uh, has anybody here familiar with control theory at all? Ah, oh, okay, then forget it. Okay. So if this field goes to zero, one other thing happens. What happens is that the source is sent an error message. And the error message is called an ICMP message. And that message is called, it's a special protocol. It's not IP, it's called ICMP Internet. I'll just spell it out. Or Internet Control Message Protocol. It's a special message. And this is almost the only place you'll see it. It is called ICMP. And it says, uh, basically, packet expired or something like that. Okay, so you send your packet, and what happens is that if it expires, you get a message back, an ICMP message saying your packet just died, sorry. And from the source of the ICMP message, you know the IP address of the router where it expired, right? So this is how, this is how traceroute works. So the way traceroute works is like this. How do you find the path? So you ha this, is, this is the source, and this is the first router, this is the second router, this is the third router, and so on. So you all use trace route for assignment one, so you know what I'm talking about. What you do is this, you send a mass message like this, IP packet like this, and you artificially set the TTL to one. What will happen is the first router is going to decrement it to zero, and it's going to send you back an ICMP message saying ICMP, okay, and then you have the source address, source equals R1. So you say, aha. The first packet along, the first router on my path to wherever is R1. 
Then what you do is you set the TTL equals 2. This is TTL equal 2. And this is going to come over here. This one is going to expire. You get back ICMP message. ICMP source equals R2. And you can actually time it. You can say, I sent it at this time, and I got it back at this time. So that means that's the round trip time. So when you send a trace route, you get three. With the, in the default parameters, you get three messages. What's happening is you're sending three packets with TTL1, three packets with TTL2, three packets with TTL3, et cetera, up to some maximum. And you just measure how, many, how, many, uh, how long it took for each of them to come back. Okay? Now, it's possible that the route changes. So R1 goes to R2, and then sometimes R1 goes to R3. Okay? In which case, your, your, your responses will be R1, R2, and then the second time around will be R1, R3. Okay? And you'll see R1, R2, R1, R3. And that tells you the routing table just changed underneath you. Okay? So routing has changed. And you'd actually see that sometimes, especially on long paths. Okay, when you did the Baidu path, you'd find often there were alternate paths or, or, or uh, there were going to be routing changes underneath you. So the, even on the same time to live value, you'll get multiple uh, IP addresses back. Yeah. Average, what's the average hop count? So we can't talk about average because it depends on where you're communicating with. So if you communicate to everybody inside University of Waterloo, your hop counts are going to be like three or four. If you communicate mostly with you know, international destinations, so that Typical diameter of the internet, okay? the number I've heard is about 20. Okay? We, we, if it's above 20, chances are pretty good something is wrong. Some routing loop is there. Right? But uh, the longest paths I've seen is about 30. Okay? And I've never seen anything longer than 30. But again, you saw Baidu was, what, 32? Right? That was fairly long. So that would be almost the longest you're going to get. You're going to the other end of the world. Right? So you'll keep getting these ICMP, and you'll know, oops, my, my TTL is too low for the packet, and you need to send something higher. Typically, your operating system will set the TTL to be like 64 or 255 when you send it out. If it doesn't get the, if the, if this packet gets lost, then it's got lost. I mean, you just get a star saying, I never got it back. I don't know what happened to it. It disappeared. So that tells you what the time to live field is. So it's a good thing to have, and it's a useful thing to have as well because you can trace the routes this way. And trace route was invented, oh, about 20 years ago. And still one of the most useful tools we use for diagnosing what's going on in the network. It's kind of interesting. It's still around. OK. Well, except the, the, what we have today, one of the tools I pointed to was trace route with geocoding. So you kind of see how the packet is going, which is kind of cool. OK. Uh, I'm going to erase this so I can continue with the fields over here. OK, so the next field is the. Uh, upper layer, or I think it's called the proto field protocol. And to explain this, let me just draw a figure over here. If you remember the sort of the standard canonical figure, So let's say that the TCP sends a packet from this source to so this destination through some number of intermediate hops shown by the dashed line. So the path is going to look something like this, right? Okay, and then into some socket above that. What has to happen at this IP? So this packet is going like so. This IP over here needs to know that it's not going to UDP. It's got to be going to TCP. Right? Don't give it to UDP because UDP have no, has no clue what these header fields mean. Right? So we need to have something in the header that tells us what to do. And that's what's called the protocol field. It's a small integer. So it's, I think, four bits. 16, one of the 16 options says, this is the protocol that you should give it to once you're done processing. So it could be TCP or UDP. It could be uh, uh, ICMP and so on. So ICMP is sitting actually at the same level over here. It's a control message protocol. And so those are fields that are being used. Okay. So that tells you where to go. And that's the protocol field. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Now the three more fields which go together, I'll write them all at the same time because they are uh, 8, 9, and 10. And uh, 
is the ID, the fragment offset, and the fa uh, fragment flags. And there are just two flags, DF and MF. And this is uh, don't fragment. And this is more fragments. OK, so <clears throat> the reason, so these three fields are together for a, re, uh, for a reason. And what it is is that it allows an IP packet to be chopped up into pieces and then put back together again. Right? So let's look at an example over here. Let's say that we have some source over here. And that source is sending a very large IP packet. So here's your header. And that's the packet sitting over there. And so along some intermediate path, we come to a router, let's say R3, where this comes in. But it has to go on a link. And this link has only allowing, is only allowing small packets, only allowing packets of size, let's say, 1,000 bytes. So this could be you know, 64,000 bytes. And only 1,000 bytes are allowed on that link. So what do you do? Okay. So what you do is that you chop it up into pieces, and you put a header on each one of them. And this is what you do. So here, let's just take a simple example. Let's just take this is 2,000 bytes. And the largest thing allowed over here is approximately 1,000 bytes. Okay. So what we'll do over here is that we'll break it up into two pieces. Okay. This is the first header. And another piece over here, another header. And this is going to be. Thousand, and it's actually not thousand. It's thousand minus twenty because this is twenty. So this is going to be thousand minus twenty, thousand minus twenty, okay. And then this one is basically let's make our life simple. This is uh, whatever two thousand minus forty. So <laughs> I'm just fudging the numbers to make it work, okay. So this is a large packet. 2,000 minus 40, and it's split it up into two packets of 980 bytes each. The, what I want to do is to chop it up in a way so that the destination, which gets two packets instead of one, can still put them back together again. right? And the way we do that is that in this field over here, we have the ID. Let's say the ID equals 2, 3, 4, 1. Then these both will have the same ID. ID equals 2, 3, 4, 1. ID equals 2, 3, 4, 1. That's the uh, uh, ID. Plus, that's the ID field. So they both have the same ID. So we know the fragments from the, same, from the same packet. The second thing is that we have the fragment offset field. Okay, The fragment offset field over here is going to be 0. Offset equals 0 because it's the beginning of the packet. This one is an offset equals 980. Because it says, yeah, I'm starting with a 980th byte, okay, or 981st, depending on your convention. And that's the offset. And then the MF says that this is more fragments or not. So the MF over here is 0. So the MF equals 1. This means there's more fragments coming. And here MF equals 0. No more fragments are coming. OK? And then, of course, we have the overall length. They both have the full length over here. And the length field for both of them okay, is going to be this one is going to be the length of this bit over here is going to be 1,000. And this one is going to be length 1,000. Okay, but that's not part of the okay, because that is each fragment itself is an IP packet, so the length field refers to that IP packet. Okay, and so when the receiver gets this, what it says, it gets the first packet. It says, okay, there's an MF flag on it. Okay, I've got to have more, more fragments are coming, and I'm going to put it into some kind of data structure which is indexed by two, three, four, one. Saying, okay, I'm going to put it there. I'll wait. When the next one comes in, it says, okay, the offset is here. And the MF is 0. So it keeps waiting until it sees an MF equals 0, and then it knows it's got everything. Right? At that point, you've got, you've got the whole packet. ID is randomly generated. And what you want to make sure is that the ID isn't repeated for all the packets you have outstanding. So typically, you kind of choose them cyclically through the space. And then you come back to the beginning again. You know, All the packets have died because the TTL has expired. Yeah, so we don't want to have any overlaps. This, by the way, opens up a big door for attack. Okay? And the door for attack, which actually is a homework question, but I'll give you the answer, is that if you, keep, if you send large packets and never set the MF equals 0, 
<laughs> okay? What's going to happen is that they're going to be assembled over there, waiting in the reassembly buffer, and they're going to sit there and sit there and sit there. So I can take a server, and I can just fill it up with packets, and never send MF equals zero, and they're going to keep waiting. And so all of the memory is going to be used up with these junk packets. So I can, spruce, I can spoof the source, so they don't know who I am, and I send this bunch of packets, and it fills up the server's buffer. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I was teaching this class in 1996, and I, I discovered this attack while I was teaching in class, saying, oh, shoot, that's going to be a problem. And so anyway, I contacted the appropriate people, and so now uh, it's protected. They, they, they don't keep it very long. They have a way to drain the, drain the buffers so that if you, don't, if, you, if you try to attack in this way, it will be taken care of. But it was, an, it was sort of something I discovered by accident in teaching it. The combining well, is very simple, right? I have the ID, and I have these bytes. I know the offsets. So I just basically stick it in the right positions in an array of bytes at the right offsets. And when it's all done, I have the whole packet. OK, so again, you can see the uh, foresight of the IP designers in that they thought about the future that links maybe not be able to carry sufficient amount of bytes. So they put it in into the protocol right up front, which is why, again, IP has been surviving for so long with very little change, because they were pretty smart when they designed it. OK. So inc incidentally, when I say they, uh, most of IP was designed by uh, two people, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn. And Vince Cerf is the chief internet evangelist for Google. He's been at Google for the last three or four years. In fact, he gave a, came and gave a talk at Waterloo about three or four years ago. And uh, Bob Kahn uh, was working at the Defense Department at the time and funded, uh, funded this. But at, when he did this work, I think both Cerf and Kahn were at Stanford. So this is where this work was done in 1973. OK, so we have the version, header, type of service, length. ID flags, the TTL, the upper layer. So then we only have one more field, which is the important field, which is the header checksum. A checksum is additional piece of information that tells you whether you have a problem uh, with your, if data's got corrupted or not, okay? So the easiest example of a checksum is what's called a parity bit. So let's look at a parity bit for a moment. So parity bit is a bit added to seven bits typically, the eighth bit, so that the number of uh, bits in the, in, the, in the string is either even or odd. So let's, call, look, let's look at the even parity. Even parity. So let's say I have a string 10110111, and then I have this bit to fill in like so. And I want to make the number of ones even. So right now I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's an odd number, so I'll put a 1 over here. And that makes it even. Let's say I have a string like 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then I have another bit over here. So this I have 1, 2, 3, 4 bits, which are even. So I'll put a 0 here because I don't need another one. I've already got even number of bits. So this bit in a box over here is extra information. It's redundant information. It's not something that carries any, extra, any, any content at all. However, it allows us to detect that something went wrong. So if one bit flips over here, let's say that flips to a zero, then the, it doesn't have an even number of bits. So you say, oops, made a mistake. You don't know which bit flipped, but you know some bit flipped. And of course, two bits might flip. Okay? If two bits flip, then you're out of luck. So you're going to say, okay, probability of two bits flipping is very low, so ignore it. And, uh, but one bit flip you can detect. So this is an example of a check bit. OK, so check bit. And uh, this is typically used in memory. So if you buy RAMs, they'll, carry, they'll say, you know, single error detect. Uh, anyway, so single error detect would be a, this would be a single error detect parity bit, OK? Uh, and you can do the same thing with odd parity. And a check sum is, uh, is similar to this. And essentially, you can think of some set of numbers, let's say A, B, C. And you add them up to get something. And you add extra d so that the sum always adds up to some number like 65536. So, okay, because that's all ones, right? So that would be an example. So you want to send a, b, and c, and you add the extra d, whatever d is, so that it adds up to this. That's called a check sum. Okay? And if any of these numbers changes, they won't add up to 65536. And then you know something happened. That's almost exactly what's done in the header. So we take all the fields, we treat them as numbers, and we add them all up. And at the end, we add whatever bits are required so that the whole thing adds up to some number. Okay. 
So, that, so this way, if anything happens in the IP header, something gets messed up, you know that the header checksum is probably not going to work out, in which case you drop the packet. Now, it's not guaranteed. It could be the case that something is messed up in just the right way so that it's not detected, but at least you, know, you have some hope of doing it. If you don't do it, you're out of luck. Okay? Now, uh, so anyway, so one, one could argue, why do these bits get flipped? It happens all the time. It happens because of uh, lightning. Uh, somebody turns on an electrical drill, you know, causes electromagnetic spikes. It happens, uh, f f you know, if you have optical fiber and it got bent by a little bit more than required, you have that happen. Many, many things can cause bits to get corrupted, and it's always a good idea to, to try and uh, uh, put a checksum in. But there are many other ways of doing error detection and correction. In fact, there's a whole theory behind, you know, error correction, uh, which I won't go into. It's a sub-branch of information theory, but I won't get into that, yeah. You know, remember, we're not checksumming the data, just the header. We're just checking the fields in the header. This field, the TTL field, the protocol field, the length field, options field. These fields, yeah, just those fields. It's on the header. It's a header checksum, not the data check. TCP has the data checksum. TCP says, I'm checking all the data, but you, IP does not. IP only does the header. I'm just saying that, let's say, this example of what a header checksum is. Let me maybe do an example over here. Let's say I define a checksum, okay? I define it. This is not what the internet is doing. Let's say checksum, okay, defined to be sum equals 100. Let's just do a simple example like this. Okay, I want to send you three numbers, 3, 10, and 20, right? And then I can fill in this number so the sum is 100. Okay, so this is 33, so I put 67 in, and it sums to 100. Okay, so if I get these four digits, 3, 10, 20, 67, I'll say, yeah, that's good. Okay? But if this gets corrupted to 21, for example, then it won't add up to 100, then I know some problem happened. I don't know what it is exactly. Process all the fields. When you're all done, you say, okay, the last little bit, okay, I'm going to put it in. That's a checksum. This is what's done for your visa card numbers, by the way. When you go to an internet check website and you put in your visa card string, the 16-digit string, it's sometimes an invalid number because it's a checksum inside. There's an algorithm that says, yeah, these numbers don't make sense. This doesn't add up to something. Okay, and then that, that allows you to detect that it's not a valid number. Okay, so that's the checksum. And then the last two bits, and we'll take a break after this, the last two fields are source address. I already talked about this. Obviously, we need source, the destination address. And then that's it, we're done. That's all the, all the fields there are in the, in, the, uh, in the IP header, okay? So these are actually the most important fields, but since we already talked about them, I'm not going to spend any more time. So we have the um, IP header. So let's go into the address allocation part, which is, uh, I don't think I'm going to get to this today, but anyway, we'll get to address allocation. So I want to solve the following problem. I have a, a laptop or a desktop at home or at work, something like that, and I need to get it an IP address. Okay? How do I get the IP address? How do I get this number? which is going to be given. I'm not talking about the, uh, the theory of IP addresses, which we now believe, you know, we understand. The theory says we need to have geographical local locality, we need to have you know, network number and subnet number, and all that good stuff. But no, I want to go with the practical part of how do you actually get it in there. And most of you are familiar with this, so I won't spend too much time on it. I'll just hopefully put that in context of what we're doing today. The first thing we need to understand is the IP address, okay, even though we talk about it, okay, is for a host, for an interface, not a host. Okay. So if you have two interfaces, you'll have two IP addresses. Okay. So many of you have laptops which have a wired interface and a wireless interface. In which case, you'll have two IP addresses, one corresponding to each interface. Okay. A router, by definition, must have at least two IP addresses. Right. You're going to have two IP addresses because uh, you're going to route, you're going to send from, pick up from one interface and send to some other interface, you've got to have at least two, which also means that any device with two interfaces can be a router. Okay, so your laptop, if it's connected to the Wi-Fi and to the uh, wired network, can actually serve as a router. It's just a bit of software inside and it allows you to become a router. So we can't, we can't really distinguish between routers and end systems anymore because uh, anything can become a router. So to be more specific, let's say you have a smartphone which has a connectivity on, on, on 3G, okay, and also has Wi-Fi on it, you can certainly make it into a hotspot. So Android phones allow you to do that. We just say, okay, this device which used to be like an endpoint now has become a router because I just turned on the software, okay? 
And so that's certainly possible, and certainly IP allows you to do that because an address is for an interface. Okay. That's the first thing. OK, so how do we get it there? So how do you decide what IP address you get? And there's sort of uh, two steps involved in it. Okay, The two steps to get an address. Okay, the first one is allocation. And the allocation means that some global authority has to allocate you the IP address. Because everybody shares in the same 32-bit space, so somebody who has global reach has got to say, okay, you can, allow, you can get it. But typically, it's, when they say you, it doesn't mean you as an individual. What happens is the allocation is typically, is almost always to organizations, because it's too hard otherwise. Okay, and the organizations will get an address block, get a block, and we know what a block means. It's like a slash twenty or a slash twenty-five or a slash thirty-two, whatever. That's not a slash thirty-two. I'm sorry, but a slash sixteen. They get a block of addresses, okay, and once they get the block, then they allocate that out to all the people in that organization, right? So the organization could be your ISP. So if you have service from Rogers, for example, Rogers has gone and got a block, and then they, they allocate it to their customers. We'll see in a minute how that's done. But how does Rogers get the allocation in the first place? The way that works is that we have something called the Internet Assigned Numbers uh, Authority. And it's uh, often called IANA. That's the acronym for it. So IANA is an entity which is a, a sort of a quasi-governmental or quasi-international organization. And it's based in the US, which, uh, because that's where it started out from. And they have responsibility for and they have control over the entire address space of the internet. All 32 bits, they control all of it. And what they do is they basically divide it up into, I think, five or six registries. I can't remember. It's either five or six, which are we call registrars. And the one that's relevant for us is uh, Aaron, which is the address, uh, Aaron, uh, American Registry of Internet Numbers. Okay, so American Registry of Internet Numbers is the one that's responsible for North America, Mexico, the Caribbean, and so on. And then there's one for Latin America, there's one for Japan, there's one for Europe, uh, and then there's one for Asia, Middle East, something like that. So I, I can't remember all, the, all of them exactly. But the one that's relevant, so RIPE is Europe, for example, um, and so on. Uh, Aaron gets a chunk of addresses from IANA. So IANA says, this is the entire space. And they say, okay, Aaron, you get this chunk. This is the American Registry of Internet Numbers. And so if Waterloo wants IP addresses, it goes to Aaron and writes an application and says, can we please have you know, a slash 16? Okay. And Aaron will say, all right, fine, you know, you're Waterloo, you look OK. And they give you the chunk. And then Waterloo, in turn, takes the chunk, a slash 16, and breaks it up into typically subnets, which are slash 8s, sorry, slash 24s. Uh, it's 256 byte chunks. And they give subnets off to different departments and so on and so forth. So we get an allocation, and that allocation is managed internally. Okay? Same thing is true for Rogers. Rogers goes to Aaron, makes a case, gets some IP addresses, and so on. And so from the perspective of IANA, they just basically hand off chunks to these regional registrars. The regional registrars then follow whatever process they want to allocate chunks to the organizations inside them, and so on. And when we do who is. Right? Or we use uh, in, the, in the assignment one, you saw what chunk uh, uh, Waterloo had. So, who is database keeps track of all these allocations. Okay? And uh, so, there is some kind of authority to keep track of this. Interestingly, these things are basically free. You know, there's nobody charging for it. Okay? It's like the address space, you don't have to pay money for it. But it is certainly very difficult to get you to make a very strong case for it. Uh, I should add a couple of sort of historical footnotes since I have a bit of time. I want to quickly tell you two things just to tell you how this kind of works. The first one is uh, 
in the early days, the chunks were handled pretty arbitrarily. You know, people would get slash eights, which means two to the power 24 addresses. And like, uh, they would just give it out because they thought, internet is a lab experiment. Who needs it? So um, when I was a, a, a long time ago, I used to be a researcher at Bell Labs. And in uh, 1995, I was working at Bell Labs. And uh, uh, internet at that time was not very commercial. In fact, it had just begun to be commercial. There was no, almost no commercial activity. And uh, AT&T, which was owned Bell Labs at the time, was uh, kind of interested in using addresses. And they went to uh, Aaron and said, hey, can we have some addresses? And they said, oh, you already have something. It turned out that lying in the back pocket of AT&T, which they didn't even know, was a complete 12, uh, was then a slash 8. It was 12 dot star. <laughs> it was a slash 8 address, two to, the, it's, you know, two to 24 addresses. They didn't even know they had it. It was allocated to Bell Labs in around 1975, and nobody bothered using it because we're using something else. We're using a slash 16. And this was worth you know, several billion dollars worth of revenue to AT&T. It was just lying around, and they didn't even know they had it. <laughs> okay. And because in 1995, nobody really cared about it. It was like, yeah, whatever. You know. uh, <laughs> anyway, the other story is that uh, I remember when India got internet, it was, it was in 1989. And all of India had, uh, was allocated uh, 256, uh, 255 addresses. <laughs> 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 the, the Indian population at the time was not very high. It was only 900 million people. <laughs> it's now 1.2 billion. But all 900 million people got 255 addresses. So that should be good enough for you. <laughs> okay. And of course, at that time in India, in 1989, there were only six IP addresses that were being used out of the 255. So it was not such a... <laughs> <laughs> there are exactly six end hosts uh, in India at the time. So uh, I could tell you more stories about it, but I won't. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, I don't know about China, but I knew the situation in India at that time. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, regional uh, disparities in the, uh, in the uh, numbers allocation, and there's a lot of fights going on about who should have more addresses and so on. So well, the people generally agree on at least two things. First, we're pretty much running out of addresses, and I'll talk about that, how to deal with that in a moment. And second, uh, you know, uh, some kind of governmental or multinational oversight needs to be happening, you know, because IANA is actually a bunch of ex-hippies sitting in an office in Santa Monica in California deciding what to do, because they used to be hippies and they never grew out of it, and they're still around handing out addresses, and you know, people think the UN should be involved and so on, but uh, it's not clear what's going to actually happen. So we got that part done. So how do we now? So now we know how the organization got the address, the allocation part. The second step is to actually hand it out, and the typical way to hand it out is uh, we can is, is basically using DHCP. So dynamic, DHCP is dynamic host configuration protocol. So dynamic host config protocol. And let me explain how that works. It's actually really, really simple. OK, so you remember my assumption that you can get to any address in the LAN, right? Remember that assumption? So I'm going to have some kind of local area network, or I should say, I can assume get any address in the subnet. So here's my subnet. And so anybody can get to any address in the subnet. And I'm going to have a special address over here. And it's called the broadcast address. And the broadcast address is typically basically the subnet number, subnet number followed by all ones, well, however many it takes to fill it out. So if I have a whatever slash something, if I fill it out with all ones after that, that's a broadcast address. That means, OK, broadcast it. And we also have a similarly, we have another way of doing broadcast inside the subnet, which is called a, a, layer, a link layer broadcast. But let's ignore that. I'm just going to assume that there is a special address I can put on my packet. And if I put that in, everybody in my subnet can hear it. Okay? That's all I want to know. So that's all, all the assumption I'm going to make. I'm going to send it out. Everybody gets it. Okay? So in this subnet, we'll have a server, which is called the DHCP server. And here is my laptop, let us say, which needs an IP address. So the laptop doesn't have an IP address. Okay? So what the laptop is going to do is that it's going to send a broadcast out 
saying, I need an IP address. Can somebody give me an IP address? Okay. The DHCP server, because it can, everybody can get to it, certainly DHCP server can get it. And what it does is it says, okay, I have a pool of addresses. I have a pool of IPs. Okay, and it's going to pick a pool of IP and send it back to the laptop saying, here, use this IP. And at that point, it has an IP address. Okay. So that's basically it. Okay. The, the couple of extra details. One detail is that when it gives the laptop the IP address, it gives it a, a, a lifetime. It says, okay, you can have this, but you have to give it up after a certain amount of time. It's called a lease time. So the lease says you have it in it for one day or one hour or whatever. At the end of the lease time, the laptop is to ask again, can I have an IP address again? And you do it. And this is what happens when you have uh, dynamic addresses at home, right? When you have a DSL line or a cable modem line at home, your endpoint actually almost always gets a dynamic address. And so every time it expires, it goes ask for something, and it may get the same IP address, it may get a different IP address, right? But the nice thing is if somebody isn't using it, then the address pool can be given to somebody else. So the total number of IPs that's allocated to, say, Rogers is smaller than the number of endpoints that are actually present because they don't all need it. That's one advantage of doing this. Okay, that's the first wrinkle. The second one is, well, if it didn't have an IP address, how did it get from here to here in the first place, right? And the way it works is that we have, uh, at the subnet level, we have at the, or, or the LAN or subnet, we have a spe different address, and we call that the media access address. And we'll talk more about that later when you talk about the link layer. And this stands for MAC, so it's MAC, is what we call it, a MAC address, a media access address, a MAC. And so the address that we use over here to do the broadcast and to get the reply back is the MAC address. Okay? And we guarantee that uh, everybody here can get to the MAC address. Can, if, you send out a, if you send out a source to be your source MAC address, which is your Ethernet address, I guess, then you're going to be able to get back to it using this. So, so to summarize, what happens is this. The laptop turns on, and it reads the interface and says, what's your MAC address? It says, okay, my MAC address is whatever it is. Once you have the MAC address, it sends a broadcast. It sends a broadcast on actually the subnet saying, I just woke up. I need an IP address. Can somebody give it to me? The DHCP server gets this address and says, okay, here's somebody with this source MAC, and here's my pool. So it picks up one of the IPs from the pool, gives it a lease, and says, okay, here's, and sends back on the source MAC. Says, here's your, here's your uh, IP address, and at that time, you, you're configured. Now, the other thing the DHCP does for you, in addition to source MAC, it actually gives you the, it gives you the IP. It also gives you the subnet mask, which you need because you need to know which subnet you're part of, and I'll talk about that when we talk about routing in a LAN. It tells you who your DNS server is, and it also tells you who your router is, what's the router IP. So these are the four bits of information you get from DHCP, and you don't have to use DHCP. You can always do it by hand. Okay, if you know these values, you can certainly go into manual mode, type in the IP, the subnet mask, the DNS, and router IP. Once you have these four things, you're on the internet. Basically, you're, you're done. Okay. Compare this with getting a cell phone. Right? When you go to a cell phone, you can't just go to you know, Future Shop, buy a cell phone, and use the manual key and tap in your IP, your subnet mask, DNS, and, and you're done. Right? No. You have to give them your credit card. You have to get a special IMEI number, and then you have to get that registered and all this other stuff. Why? Because it costs them real money. You're paying real money for the cell phone network, whereas here you're getting on the internet. So this simplicity makes it possible for the internet to grow like crazy, but also makes it possible for anybody to spoof anybody else because there's no validation. You know, anybody can just type in these things.